My name's Joe, and welcome to part three of my collection room slash man cave tour. If you haven't seen parts one and two yet, I'd really appreciate if you go back and check those out sometime. Today I'm going to be going over my diecast Batmobile collection I have on the wall back here, my Legends of the Dark Knight shelf, my Marvel and DC Comics action figure collection, my three and three quarter inch Star Wars Death Star display, and I have a few more things over here. I used to have my Death Star set up on one of those cheap plastic utility shelves, and up until a couple months ago, I had the majority of my DC and Marvel figures in plastic tubs stacked on the floor here. I used my tax return to buy these Billy bookcases from Ikea. They're relatively inexpensive, they're plain and simple, and I like them because they don't distract from your collection. We have a lot to cover today, so grab some beers and get comfortable. Cheers. Alright, so first off, the cases these Batmobiles and Bat-related vehicles are in came from Michael's Arts and Crafts stores. The two bigger square cases are actually meant for shot glasses or golf balls, but I unscrewed the hangers on the backs of these cases and screwed them back on the sides so that these slots would fit 164th scale cars. The clasp is on the top and the hinges are on the bottom. I thought it would be easier to do it that way than have to hold the doors up while I rearrange these cars, but it would probably be a pain in the ass either way. These cases aren't cheap. I think the smaller ones are around $30, and I think the bigger square cases are $50. If you go to Michael's looking for these, and they're all at full price, I would just wait a week or so and check back. Also, if they don't have these cases or whatever else you're looking for in stock at the retail stores, you can go to the website and have them shipped to the store, so you'll save money on shipping costs, which are pretty high for items that are this large. The metal Batman signs came from Hobby Lobby Arts and Crafts stores, and they are really similar to Michael's in that they have 50% off sales on home decor stuff like this fairly often. It seems like they have this sort of thing on sale every other week. I guess it goes to show you how much retail stores mark up everything if they can afford to sell it for half price all the time. I didn't pay full price for any of these signs either. The Batmobiles in this top row of cabinets are comic style Batmobiles in order of how they appeared in the comic books. There's 143rd scale Eagle Moss Batmobiles, 143rd scale Corgi Batmobiles, and 150 scale Hot Wheels Bat Vehicles. In the top left hand corner is the very first Batmobile from 1939, when Bruce Wayne just drove his regular vehicle around when he was fighting crime as Batman. Then we have various Bat Vehicles and villain cars from the 40s, 50s, all the way through to the 60s. Most of the figurines in these cabinets are Jada die-cast metal nano figurines. I don't think they are particularly popular with collectors because none of them are rare or hard to find. The best part is that they only cost about a dollar each, and I only collect Batman related characters. Moving across to the right is another cabinet filled with Batmobiles and other Bat vehicles from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. These are some of my favorites because the bright blue paint jobs on these Batmobiles stand out more from the all-black cabinets. And I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, so I'm more partial to some of these Batmobile designs than some of the others in my collection. The Batman figurine in the center of the third shelf down is a plastic superpowers style Batman figurine that I bought at Walgreens while I was looking for Marvel Legends action figures. I think they were originally four or five dollars, which is way too much for them, but I bought all the Batman related ones for 59 cents each while they were on sale. Next up is another cabinet with Batmobiles from the 90s all the way up to the mid 2000s. Some of these 143rd scale Batmobiles were made by Corgi, and some of them are part of the Batman Automobilia line by Eagle Moss. Again, I prefer the cars that have the bright blue paint jobs over the dark blue or black paint because they stand out more from the cabinets. These 2000s era vehicles towards the bottom have really nice designs, but they're kind of hard to see. Most of the cars in the next two cases are pretty silly, but I think they're a lot of fun. These are Hot Wheels 164 scale cars, and I think they're mostly designs from the basic line that Hot Wheels has repurposed by painting Batman characters and logos on the sides and on the hoods. In some cases I think these vehicles look like cars the characters might actually drive, but mostly they're just vehicles that have a big enough canvas for the characters to be painted on. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they're called Tampos. There's a couple of exceptions in this cabinet. This is an original Batmobile design by Hot Wheels when they first got the license. And this is a warped version of that Batmobile called the Cruise Batmobile. Here are some more of those goofy, fantasy-style Bat vehicles. In the center of the top row are a couple of Matchbox Batmobiles, 
but all the rest of these are manufactured by Hot Wheels. The bottom four rows in this case are all Batman related DC Comics character cars. In some cases the vehicles look like cars that the characters might actually drive, but I think the more fun character cars look like the character transformed into a vehicle somehow. Now I know that's a really silly concept, but these cars are really fun to collect, they're easy to find, and they're fairly inexpensive. There's a review of my collection of DC Comics character cars on my channel if you're interested in checking that out. And I really get a kick out of displaying these next to the Jada diecast metal nano figurines. Some of these are brand new ones that I just found recently, like the Bane, the Bronze Age Batman, the Riddler, and the Deadshot down in the corner. And it just occurred to me to open these cases up to cut down on the glare. The next row of cabinets contains the majority of my Batmobiles and other Batman related vehicles based on movies, cartoons, and TV shows. First off we have some Hot Wheels 150 scale vehicles based on the 1960's Adam West movie and TV show. There's a small group of 164 scale Adam West Batmobiles. Then we have some unofficial 164 scale Joker Goon cars by Johnny Lightning on either side of an Ertl 164 scale Batmobile from the 1989 Batman movie. There's an Ertl Joker van, Eagle Moss 143rd scale 1989 Batmobile, and on the bottom row are some 150 scale Hot Wheels vehicles. There's the Battle Damage 1989 Batmobile from a Toys R Us exclusive 3 pack, there's an Armored Up Batmobile, and the Penguin's Duck vehicle from Batman Returns. In this next case we have some basic 164 scale 1989 Batmobiles. And there's an Ertl Bat Missile from Batman Returns in the center. Then we have some Hot Wheels Hard Nose Batmobiles, which are basically warped versions of the 1989 Batmobile. The next three rows of vehicles are based on Batman the Animated Series and the New Adventures of Batman. And on the bottom row is a Hot Wheels 150 scale Batman Forever Batmobile and a few really janky 164 scale Kenner vehicles based on Batman Forever. And finally, in this last case, on the top row are some vehicles based on the Batman and Robin movie. Then we have some Hot Wheels, 164 scale Batmobiles from the Batman and the Batman Brave and the Bold cartoon shows. Then we have some Hot Wheels, 150 scale Tumblr Batmobiles and the Bat from the Dark Knight Trilogy. There's a couple of rows of 164 scale vehicles, also from the Dark Knight Trilogy. And finally on the bottom are some 150 scale and 164 scale vehicles from Batman v Superman and Justice League. And you can probably tell which movies and TV shows are my favorites because those are the ones that I have the most vehicles from. This is a set of cars based on the Batman classic TV series from the Hot Wheels 164 scale pop culture line. Whereas most of the basic 164 scale Hot Wheels cars either have a plastic body or a plastic frame, these cars are 100% die cast metal. They typically have more and better paint applications than your basic Hot Wheels cars, and these have real rubber tires. For all those reasons, these cars also come at a higher price point. These retail for $5 or $6 each. That is, if you can find them at a retail store. Hot Wheels makes lots of different vehicles for their pop culture line, and they're all real similar to this. Some of them have Star Wars characters painted on the sides, some of them have cartoon characters like Scooby-Doo, and I've even seen some with characters from Mad Magazine. And for whatever reason, these cars in particular are really popular with hardcore Hot Wheels collectors and scalpers. In fact, this is the only set of these pop culture vehicles that I've been able to complete. I found the Riddler, Catwoman, Robin, and Penguin cars at retail, and I picked up the Joker van and the Batman funny car for $5 each at a local comic book convention last year. Here's another little group of Hot Wheels 164 scale pop culture cars. And these vehicles are from two or three different waves of DC Comics pop culture vehicles. Sometimes a set or a wave of these vehicles comes out, and some of the cars feature characters that I'm not interested in, like Darkseid or Lex Luthor, because I only collect Batman related diecast vehicles. However, some of them are just really, really hard to find because of Hot Wheels scalpers. And these scummy scalper guys hit up Walmart and Target stores early in the morning and buy stuff specifically to resell it in their booths at a flea market or on eBay often for four or five times the regular retail price. And I think they create an artificial scarcity for some of these cars by buying up all of one particular vehicle so that other people are forced to go to eBay, for instance, in order to find them. Right below the die-cast bat vehicles that I have on the wall is a built-in shelf where I display the majority of my Batman figures. I kind of consider this my Legends of the Dark Knight shelf. These figures come from different toy lines, 
by different manufacturers. Some are based on video games, cartoons, and comic books. Some of them are based on a specific story arc, and some are made to look like artwork by a specific comic book artist. And there's a few custom figures on this shelf too. First off we have the Kotobukiya Superpowers Batman PVC statue. And I'm really happy with it. The paint on it is immaculate and the price is right. I think those Superpowers statues run $25 or $30 on Amazon. In front of him is the DC Collectibles Icons Last Rights Batman. And it's a pretty solid figure until you pose him with any other figures. Then he seems really petite. In fact, as I get new Batman figures that I like better, he's probably going to be the first one that gets swapped out. Right behind him is the Mattel Young Justice Batman figure that came with a big diorama piece with a gargoyle on it. He's a pretty solid figure, and I really like the cape draped over his shoulders, but it really restricts the articulation in his upper body. Right in front of him in the red is the DC Collectibles Earth 2 Thomas Wayne Batman. Earth 2 was the New 52's answer to the Justice Society, and Thomas Wayne was the Batman for that universe. I was really into the Earth 2 comics for a while, mostly because of the incredible artwork by Nicholas Scott. Right behind him is the Toys R Us exclusive Arkham City Batman in the silver or bronze age color scheme. And I really like the way he looks, but you can't do a lot with this figure because his articulation is pretty whack. Next up is the DC Collectibles Arkham Knight Catwoman, and I think she looks incredible. The hip joints on mine are very loose, but she hasn't fallen over the whole time I've had her on display like this. Right behind her is the Arkham Origins Batman by DC Collectibles, and he's got a lot of really nice articulation, especially for a DC Collectibles figure. Next we have the DC Collectibles Arkham Knight Commissioner Gordon. I think he looks really good, and he comes with a lot of really nice accessories. And right behind him is the DC Collectibles Arkham Knight Joker, with a trucker hat and a Hawaiian shirt on. Now, I don't really play the Arkhamverse video games. I just buy some of the action figures if I think they look cool. I assume that the video game series did their own take on the Killing Joke story arc, but I'm not 100% sure. The main reason I picked up this Joker figure is because I got him really cheap. I like him a lot, but his ankle joints are really loose and he falls over fairly often. Here we have a DC Direct Killing Joke Batman based on artwork by Brian Boland. Behind him is the DC Collectibles Darwin Cook Designer Series Batman figure, right next to the DC Direct New Frontier Batman that's also based on artwork by Darwin Cook. Right in front of them is a custom Oracle figure, and she's basically just the Marvel Legends Mary Jane Watson figure. I touched up some of her paint, made some custom glasses for her out of thin wire, and I dry brushed her jeans with light blue acrylic paint. Her wheelchair came from a Toy Biz Professor X figure from the first X-Men movie that I bought for $4 at a local comic book shop. Next to her is the DC Direct Killing Joke Joker. I did a review of the Killing Joke comic book and all these figures for my channel a while back. So if you're interested in finding out more about these, and I encourage you to check that out after you finish watching this video. That bigger Batman figure in the back is a Play Arts Kai Arkhamverse Dark Knight Returns Batman. And I guess in the game you can change the skin or the way Batman looks. And this bulkier Batman in the Dark Knight Returns costume is one of your options. This figure looks really nice, but just like most of the Batman figures that have the cape draped over the shoulders like this, the articulation is a little limited. Back to the front row again is the DC Collectibles animated series style Batman figure based on the design by Bruce Timm. Right behind that is an old DC Direct first appearance Batgirl. Then we have a DC Direct Tim Sale style Batman from the Long Halloween and Dark Victory. And behind him is the Mattel Batman Unlimited Vampire Batman from the Red Rain, Bloodstorm, and Crimson Mist Elseworlds comics. Alright, next up is the DC Collectibles Aunt Lucia Designer Series Bombshells Poison Ivy figure. Right behind her is the DC Multiverse Toys R Us exclusive Damian Wayne Robin figure. That figure is kind of lousy, but he was the least expensive option for a Damian Wayne Robin figure for me, and I will swap him out as soon as a better version comes along. Moving back to the front is the DC Collectibles Death of the Family Joker. He's not a designer series figure per se, but he looks exactly like the artwork from The Death of the Family by Greg Capullo. Behind him is the DC Multiverse Endgame Joker. And DC Collectibles made a figure that's very similar to this, but I actually prefer the head sculpt on this version more. And I got this one for $5. In front with a rock climbing gear and the crossbow is the DC Collectibles Greg Capullo Designer Series 
Zero Year Survivor Batman. And to be honest, Zero Year was not one of my favorite story arcs from Scott Snyder's run, but it did yield some pretty kick-ass Batman figures. It might be kind of hard to see, but directly behind him is the DC Collectibles Greg Capullo Designer Series Zero Year Batman. And this is basically Batman's Mark I suit in Scott Snyder's New 52 continuity. Front and center is the DC Collectibles Icons Afterbirth Batman. This figure is a big improvement over the last rights Batman, but it's kind of too little too late. However, I do really like the suit, and I hope that the yellow outline around the bat symbol on his chest indicates that the yellow oval will be making a comeback soon. Right behind him is the DC Collectibles Greg Capullo Designer Series Thrasher Suit Batman. This was a suit of armor that Batman had laying around when the Talon Assassins infiltrated the Bat Cave in the Court of Owls story. I think this figure retailed for $35 or $40 originally, and it felt like a steal because of all the amazing detail and articulation. This figure even has articulated digits in his fingers. To his right in the front is the DC Collectibles Greg Capullo Designer Series New 52 Batman. I think this figure looks really great, and his articulation is pretty decent too. But my favorite part is that there is space between his fingers on his right hand to hold these small batarangs in between his knuckles. And that looks pretty badass. Right behind him is the Mattel DC Multiverse version of the Zero Year Batman. And the main reason I bought him was because I'd been out toy hunting that day, I hadn't had any luck, and then I found this figure marked down, and basically just bought him so I wouldn't come home empty handed. Moving back to the front is the DC Collectibles Joker figure from the very first issue of the New 52 Detective Comics run, before he gets his face cut off by the doll maker. Obviously this isn't your traditional Joker design, but I think he looks dope like a stone-cold killer. He came with a kitchen knife, and I found a crowbar to put in his other hand. Behind him is the DC Collectibles New 52 Poison Ivy figure. Even though she's basically just like a plastic statue, I still really like her a lot, although I would prefer a classic Poison Ivy figure. Moving back to the front again is the DC Collectibles Aunt Lucia Designer Series Bombshells Harley Quinn figure. And I did a review of her and the Bombshells Poison Ivy figure a little over a year ago. That was actually the first video I uploaded to YouTube where I did any speaking. It was all off the cuff, and I stuttered and stammered a lot. It's pretty painful for me to watch now, so if you're interested in getting a closer look at either of these figures, you can go back and check that video out if you'd like. Right behind her is the Mattel Batman Unlimited New 52 Batgirl figure. To the left in the back is the recent DC Multiverse Batwing figure. This is Lucius Fox's son, Luke Fox who is a recent addition to the Bat family. I think he looks pretty cool, and he's a decent figure. In front of him is the all-black Batman from DC Universe Classics Wave 10. And I think this is supposed to be an homage to the old Toy Biz Batman figure based on the 1989 Batman movie. Next we have a DC Direct Batman and Son Tim Drake Robin. Moving back to the front is a DC Collectibles New Adventures Batman based on the design by Bruce Tim. He looks really cool, but one of his feet broke off at the ankle as I was removing it from the package, so that's really disappointing. Right behind him is another Play Arts Kai Arkham video game Batman figure, but this one is in what they refer to as the 70s skin, so he's basically a silver or bronze age Batman done up in this hyper-realistic manga or anime style. And I really love this figure because he reminds me of the way Batman is depicted in the Batman manga Child of Dreams, and also in the Batman Hong Kong graphic novel. This figure has lots of really nice articulation. In fact, even his cape is articulated. And these parts that drape over his shoulders are on hinge joints, so you can make better use of the shoulder and bicep articulation. If the house was on fire, this is one of the figures I would try to rescue. He's definitely one of my favorite Batman figures in my collection. Right in front are some Golden Age era Catwoman, Batman, and Joker figures from the Batman Legacy line by Mattel. My Arkham Knight Catwoman generously donated her bullwhip to this Catwoman figure because she did not come with any accessories. There was a Kmart exclusive version of this Batman figure that came with a Batmite figure as an accessory, but all the Kmart stores in my area were total bullshit and have since closed down. So unfortunately I was never able to find the exclusive version with Batmite. This Joker figure has a couple of problems. His neck articulation is almost non-existent, and with the way his eyes are painted, it's like he's perpetually looking down. Also, the color purple of his pants from the thigh swivel down doesn't match the color purple used for the rest of the figure's legs. 
but it's not always noticeable in different lighting conditions. And aside from those two problems, I still really like this figure. Behind them, to the right of the Play Arts Batman, is the DC Collectibles Lieber Mayho Designer Series Batman figure, and the DC Direct Trinity Batman, based on the artwork of Matt Wagner. I'm not a huge fan of Trinity, but I did really like Matt Wagner's Batman and the Monster Men and Batman and the Mad Monk. Up next is a DC Direct Nightfall Nightwing figure, and in front of him is a DC Direct Teen Titans Tim Drake Robin. And even though this figure isn't the greatest, as far as articulation goes, this is my absolute favorite costume for Robin. I always thought this costume was a necessary update that seems much more practical without pissing all over the original design for the Robin costume. Moving to the back is the Mattel DC Universe Classics Azrael Batman. And this has got to be one of my top two or three favorite DC Universe Classics figures. The sculpted and painted details on this figure are excellent, and he has better articulation than your typical DC UC figure. The only downside to this Azrael Batman is that the spikes on his gauntlets are pointing the wrong direction. In front of him is a Mattel DC Superheroes Batgirl, and this figure came in a two-pack with a blue and gray Batman figure. Right beside her is a custom Year 2 Batman figure, and right behind him is a custom Reaper figure from Year 2 and Batman Full Circle. And I did a really in-depth review of those comics and these figures a few months back. I'd really appreciate it if you go check that video out sometime too. In the back right hand corner is the DC Collectibles Earth 2 Bruce Wayne Batman. And spoiler alert for a comic book that's several years old at this point, Bruce Wayne Batman is killed in the very first issue of Earth 2. But this is a pretty cool figure and I really love this costume design. In fact I saw a guy cosplaying as this version of Batman a few years ago at a convention and it really kicked ass. And finally, in front is a DC Direct first appearance Cassandra Cain Batgirl figure that I picked up recently in a trade. Now when I got this figure she was in pretty rough shape, like she'd been thrown into a tub with a bunch of other loose figures, and she had a bunch of white scuff marks all over her. I assumed that she had rubbed up against some other figures and the white paint had transferred onto her. But when I tried to use paint remover to get rid of the white scratches, I realized that this figure was cast in white plastic and then painted black which doesn't make any sense to me. I have no idea why you wouldn't just cast this figure in black plastic instead of painting the whole fucking thing black. At any rate, I completely repainted this figure from head to toe with acrylic paints, except for the belt. Obviously, I would like to have a more articulated version of Cassandra Kane, like the DC Super Heroes version by Mattel, but this figure didn't cost me very much, and she can serve as a placeholder in my collection until someone makes a nice, official Cassandra Kane back row or until I can make a custom figure that isn't pre-posed and has better articulation. So maybe you were thinking, oh good, he's done talking about Batmobiles. I'm sick of hearing about that shit. Get on to the Marvel Legends figures. Well, here's the rest of my diecast Batmobile collection. First off, we have the Eagle Moss Automobilia Bat Tank from the Dark Knight Returns. Then on top of this first plexiglass case is a set of Hot Wheels 164 scale Batman Live Batmobiles. I guess these are models based on the Batmobile that was used for a Batman Live stage show. Kind of like Disney on Ice, but no Disney characters and no ice. Then we have a Hot Wheels 118th scale Adam West Batmobile from the 60s television show and movie. Here in the Midwest, we have a chain of stores called Vintage Stock that buys and sells movies, music, and toys. And I found this Batmobile there for $24.99. It was technically used because they bought it from some person off the street. However, it was still mint in box. eBay sellers were asking a minimum of $60 for these at the time, so I was thrilled to pick it up for less than half of what it would have cost me online. Next to the Bat Tank, we have the small running press light-up Bat Signal next to a die-cast metal Commissioner Gordon figure. Then we have a new Hot Wheels 150 scale Batman the Animated Series Batmobile, Eagle Moss Bat Locomotive, the Batmobile from the Arkham video game series, a comic book style Joker Copter, and the Lee Bermejo Batmobile from Batman Noel, all from the Automobilia line. Behind them in the second plastic case is a 70's Eagle Moss Bat Copter, an Eagle Moss Bat Plane, a Corgi 143rd scale Bat Marine, and the Eagle Moss Bat Cycle. And on top of that case, we have some basic Hot Wheels 164 scale Arkham Asylum Batmobiles. And you might be saying, why do you need five of the same car, Joe? Well, even though these cars are all based on the same mold, they all have slightly different paint, or a slightly different finish, or a different colored windshield. 
And these cars only cost a dollar each. So what the hell? Get off my back! Moving straight down to the first shelf of my Billy bookcases is my collection of Daredevil slash Defenders slash Street Level Heroes Marvel Legends figures. First off is my old Daredevil figure from back when Hasbro first started making Marvel Legends. He's got some issues with scale, but I still have a soft spot for him because he was my first Daredevil figure, and Daredevil is one of my favorite Marvel Comics characters. Next we have the old Toy Biz Marvel Legends Luke Cage in his original costume, and right behind him is a Captain America Civil War Giant Man Wave Nuke figure. My mom found the telephone booth behind Nuke at a flea market or a yard sale, and it's actually a coin bank, but I repainted it silver to use as a diorama piece for my action figures. Moving back to the front is an Articulated Icons Basic Red Ninja that I bought from Robo at a local comic book convention back in November. Then we have the Dormammu Wave Iron Fist figure, the Walgreens exclusive Daredevil figure in the original yellow and red costume, and right behind him is the old Toy Biz Punisher figure. Moving back to the front again is my custom Bullseye action figure, and there's a really in-depth review of that figure on my channel if you're interested in finding out more about him. I completed this custom Bullseye figure right before Hasbro announced their latest official Bullseye figure, from the Man-Thing wave, but after having handled that figure, I still prefer my custom Bullseye. Right behind him is the Walgreens exclusive Jim Lee style Punisher figure, and behind that is the old Toy Biz face-off two-pack kingpin on a diorama base that came with a Marvel Select Deadpool figure. In the center is the old Toy Biz Electra, and I can't wait for the new Electra figure coming out later this year, because she is long overdue for an update. Right behind her is the Toy Biz face-off two-pack Daredevil figure, perched on the cross diorama piece that came with the Marvel Select Daredevil. Moving back to the front again, fighting Bullseye, is the Hobgoblin Wave Daredevil figure. And he's tied for first place, along with a Toy Biz face-off Daredevil, as my overall favorite Daredevil figure. Right behind the Hobgoblin Wave Daredevil is the Epic Heroes Punisher. The Epic Heroes Wave is the one that came with figure stands instead of Build-A-Figure parts, pretty early on in the return of Marvel Legends. Then we have a Jewel or Jessica Jones figure from the Amazon exclusive Defenders 4 pack. Moving back to the front again is an Articulated Icons Black Ninja figure. Basically I'm using the red and black Articulated Icons ninjas as hand ninjas in my display. I had a booth at a local comic book convention back in November and two tables down from me was Robo from the Fwoosh selling these Articulated Icons figures. I traded some custom action figure flight stands for this pair of ninjas and I really love these figures. I only wish I'd gotten more of them. And there's a review of these Articulated Icons Ninjas on my channel if you'd like to find out more about them. Behind the Black Ninja is the Retro Black Widow figure with the alternate long hair head from the Black Widow motorcycle set. And she also has a custom Widow Sting electricity effect that I made out of blue colored wire. Right above her, standing on a dumpster that came with a Marvel Select Movie Wolverine figure, is the Amazon exclusive Defenders 4-Pack Daredevil. Then moving back down is the Defenders 4-Pack shirtless Iron Fist figure and the modern Luke Cage. My wife bought me that 4-Pack for Christmas and I'm really thrilled to have Jewel and especially this Luke Cage figure in my collection now. And finally, all the way in the back corner is the Marvel Legends Retro Punisher figure that I picked up for $5. And I know I'm in the minority here, but I do not like the non-bandana head sculpt that came with this figure. So I repainted the hair and eyebrows on an extra Steve Rogers head sculpt and slapped that on instead. Now I either need to repaint the neck to match the new head or just use some goof off to remove the flesh tone paint altogether because the flesh tone on the neck does not match the new head. This Punisher figure is standing on a diorama base that came with a Marvel Select Electro figure. So I reviewed my entire Daredevil slash Punisher slash Defenders slash Street Level Heroes Marvel Legends figures a while back when the Defenders show first came out on Netflix. However, since then I've added the Articulated Icons Ninjas, the Retro Black Widow and Punisher figures, and the Amazon exclusive box set figures to my collection. So if you check out that review, keep in mind that I hadn't gotten those figures yet. I'm really excited about the upcoming Elektra, the new modern Daredevil in the all-black costume, and the Typhoid Mary Marvel Legends figures coming out later this year. Daredevil is one of my favorite Marvel Comics characters. Maybe it's because we're both gingers. So if you like the Netflix shows and you're curious about which comics are worth reading, I recommend picking up pretty much anything by Frank Miller.
I have a trade paperback called Visionaries that collects a ton of excellent and noteworthy Daredevil stories by Frank Miller. Daredevil Born Again by Frank Miller and David Mazzuchelli is fantastic. Daredevil Yellow by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale is really good. Mark Wade and Chris Samney's Daredevil run is outstanding. And the current Daredevil series by Charles Soule and Ron Garney has been really great too. In fact, Charles Soule is a lawyer who also happens to write comics, so he's a perfect fit for Daredevil. Next up is my DC Comics Superhero Shelf. This collection is a mixture of Mattel's, DC Universe Classics, DC Direct, and DC Collectibles action figures. From front to back, left to right, first off is a DC Universe Classics Adam figure. I never found that figure at retail. I bought mine loose at a local comic book shop, and his paint was in really poor condition, so I had to repaint him myself. And the miniature Adam figure came with the Walgreens exclusive Dark Knight Strikes Again Flash figure. I need to repaint that miniature figure to match the costume of the 6 inch version. Behind them is the DC Universe Classic Zatanna, there's a DC Direct Red Tornado, and all the way in the back is a DC Collectibles Stargirl. Moving back to the front again is a DC Universe Classics Martian Manhunter, there's a San Diego Comic Con exclusive DCUC Plastic Man, and right behind him is the Bronze Tiger. Back to the front again, we have the DC Universe Classics Flash figure, an old DC Direct John Stewart Green Lantern, DC Universe Classics Hour Man, and behind him is a DC Universe Classics Hawkman. And that Hawkman is one of my favorite DC UC figures, because he has some unique sculpted detail and a lot of really nice accessories. Moving back to the front again is the DC Universe Classics Hal Jordan Green Lantern, the DC UC Black Canary, the DC UC Alan Scott Green Lantern, and again in the back is a DC UC Spectre figure. Alright, back up in front is the DC UC Wonder Woman figure with a sword from one of the DC Multiverse Wonder Woman movie figures. Right behind her is a DC Universe style fire figure that came from the Maddie Collector Signature Series or Club Infinite Earth subscription. And I remember really liking this character back in the 90s when I was reading Justice League comics. But this figure is really disappointing. She's way out of scale with the rest of these figures and her articulation sucks. I think it would have been better if Mattel made a fire figure that was cast in green tinted transparent plastic with the hair tapering off into flames as if she was using her superpowers. Behind her is a DC Direct Firestorm figure that I bought loose at a local comic book shop with a custom energy effect piece that I made out of twisty ties. Moving back to the front again in the center is my current favorite DC UC style Superman figure. The DC Multiverse Super Friends Superman. And he's basically just your standard DC UC Superman but with a cloth cape. And I'm a really big fan of these cloth capes and I love the shade of blue that they use for this Superman. I think most of Mattel's Superman figures have costumes that are darker blue than they really should be. Right behind him is an old DC Direct Kyle Rayner Green Lantern figure. I got this figure really cheap on eBay. Even though he doesn't have as many points of articulation as DC UC figures do, I think his scale and overall aesthetic works really well with DC Universe Classics. Especially if you were trying to build a Grant Morrison 90's era Justice League. There have been some photos floating around online of an upcoming DC Multiverse wave that includes a 90's era Kyle Rayner Green Lantern. But the way Mattel has been dragging their feet releasing DC Multiverse waves, it'll probably be at least a year before that figure makes it to stores. And until then, I'm really happy with this DC Direct version. If and when I do get the DC Multiverse Kyle Rayner, I will still keep this figure for a Green Lantern core display. Moving all the way to the back now is the DC Collectibles New 52 Starfire. And that's a pretty decent looking figure, but I don't care for the costume at all. I would much prefer a classic Starfire figure. So this one is kind of a placeholder in my collection. Moving back to the front again is the DCUC Wave 1 Crime Stopper Batman. And I didn't start collecting 6 inch superhero figures until this figure was long gone from stores. I bought this figure loose from a collector on Facebook and he didn't come with all of his original accessories. I need to touch up a few paint flaws in this figure but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. And right behind Batman is a bootleg of the Signature Series or DC Club Infinite Earths Ice figure that I bought from China Bay for $11 shipped. She originally had really poor paint applications so I had to do a lot of work to make her halfway presentable. Just like Fire, I think she's out of scale and her articulation leaves a lot to be desired. It would be awesome if DC Collectibles could get away from 
just doing action figures of core Justice League members, and show some love to more obscure characters like Fire and Ice, because I would love to replace these two with better figures. Right behind her is the DC Collectibles New 52 Cyborg figure. And I have the DC UC version of Cyborg, but I think this figure has more shelf presence. And I really like that alternate arm with a big ass claw and the pistons jutting out the bottom. Behind the Crime Stopper Batman is another one of my favorite DC UC figures, Green Arrow. The only thing that would make this figure better is if his bow had a real string on it. Behind him we have a DC Direct Brightest Day Hawkwoman, and behind her up top is the old DC Direct Dr. Fate. I genuinely like both of these figures, but the main reason I bought them was because I couldn't find the DC Universe Classics versions for a decent price. I repainted the Dr. Fate figure's helmet to match the yellow parts of his costume. Moving back to the front again is a DC Universe Classics Robin figure, and I prefer to think of this as a Dick Grayson Robin, although Jason Todd was drawn with his hair like this sometimes too. This is Katana. She's got my back. I would advise not being killed by her. Her sword steals the souls of its victims. Next we have the DC Club Infinite Earths Maddie Collector Subscription Elongated Man. And right above him is the DC Unlimited New 52 Hawkman figure. And if you can't find the other DC Universe Classics Hawkman for a decent price, I think this figure will make a fine substitute. He's a pretty kick-ass Hawkman figure. Moving back to the front again is a DC Universe Classics Aquaman figure. I bought this one in a Toys R Us exclusive 2-pack with Merman from Masters of the Universe because it was the easiest and least expensive way for me to get a classic looking Aquaman figure at the time. The single carded version was going for way more than I wanted to spend on the secondary market. And all I had to do was unload the Merman figure on eBay. Right behind him is a DCUC Dr. Midnight figure and then we have the DC Direct Brightest Day Mara figure. And being a DC Direct figure, she's out of scale with my Aquaman figure here, and that's the only reason why I don't have her up front closer to him. This character is Captain Marvel. He was granted superpowers by a wizard named Shazam. And Shazam is the magic word that Billy Batson says to become Captain Marvel. I don't give a fuck what anybody says, Shazam is not his name. His name is Captain Marvel. Next to Captain Marvel is a DC Universe Classics Power Girl figure, and then we have an old DC Direct Jay Garrick Flash figure. Finally in the corner is a DC Universe Classics San Diego Comic Con exclusive Swamp Thing figure. And there is a more expensive version that came with a few unmen accessories, but this is just the standard version. And I picked this up on the Manny Collector website for $25 or $30 on clearance. This figure has a plastic body with a rubbery shell stretched over it, and I don't know how the rubber is going to hold up over time, he feels a bit tacky to the touch right now, and I'm scared to put him in extreme poses because I don't want to tear the rubber coating. But he looks really great, the sculpted and painted details on this figure are fantastic, and this is pretty much exactly what I think of when I think of Swamp Thing. Right below my DC Super Heroes collection is my DC Super Villains collection. And just like the last shelf, this collection consists mostly of Mattel figures, like DC Universe Classics, DC Super Heroes, and DC Multiverse figures with a few DC Direct and DC Collectibles figures sprinkled in. First up in front is a DC UC style Mirror Master from the Matty Collector subscription thing. He's a really cool figure, but it just makes me wish that we'd have gotten more of the Flash's rogues in the DC Universe line. Right behind him is the Green Lantern Classics Manhunter figure, and back in the corner is the DC Collectibles New 52 Parademon figure. And if I remember correctly, I think that was the same price as any other DC Collectibles figure at the time which was around $25. At that price, he's a fantastic figure. I wish I had gotten another one. If Mattel made a Parademon figure that size, he would have been a Collect and Connect figure, and I probably wouldn't have gotten one. Moving back to the front is a custom 90's Jim Ballant era Catwoman figure that I made from a Green Lantern Classics Star Sapphire. Behind her is a DC Collectibles Icons Joker figure, and I put him on a figure stand to give him a little height because he's a little on the short side. Next to him is a DC Universe Classics Toy Man figure. And right behind them is a custom Solomon Grundy. The base body for that custom came in a 3 and 3 quarter inch scale DC Multiverse Arkham 2 pack with Batman and a diorama piece that was supposed to look like part of a jail cell. I filled in the hole in his chest and sculpted over it 
to look like a shirt with a collar on it. And I sculpted the head from scratch right on top of the tiny original head. My custom is basically a classic looking Solomon Grundy figure, except he doesn't have sleeves. And he could stand to be a little taller, but overall I'm pretty happy with this. I like Solomon Grundy, but not enough to spend 80 or or $100 or whatever people are asking for on eBay for the Collect and Connect figure. Moving back to the front is a DC Universe Classic Sinestro. Right behind him is a DCUC Riddler with the suit and the derby hat. And I think that came out in Wave 5, which was a Walmart exclusive wave. But I bought mine loose at a local comic shop. Right behind him is the DC Multiverse Justice League movie Parademon figure. And yes, I know I have the wings on backwards, but I don't care. I think this looks much better. Moving back to the front again is the DC Direct Ares figure. This Ares figure had been in my Wonder Woman display until recently, but I just bought the entire wave of the DC Multiverse Wonder Woman movie figures at 5 Below to build the inaccurate Wonder Woman movie Ares Collect and Connect figure, and I replaced this old DC Direct Ares with the new Multiverse version in my Wonder Woman display. Behind him is the DC Universe Classics Magog figure from Kingdom Come, and I guess he was brought into the DC Universe proper because I have some Justice Society comics with him as the villain. And right behind him is the Mattel DC Superheroes Mongol figure that I got in a two-pack with Cyborg Superman. This Mongol figure is outstanding. This was back when Mattel really gave a shit, and they put a lot more care and attention in their DC Superheroes figures than most of their DC Universe classics. Right up in front in the center is the DC Collectibles Crime Syndicate figures from the Forever Evil storyline. First we have Johnny Quick, then Superwoman, there's Ultraman in the center with Atomica between his feet. And then we have Owlman and Power Ring. And these are some of the most articulated figures that DC Collectibles has ever made. However, this was when they were using that brittle, clear plastic for a lot of their joints. And these figures are a little fragile. Also, I had issues with the paint on a few of these. So I touched up a few spots on Ultraman, Owlman, and Power Ring. Overall, I really like the look of these figures. I think they fit in with DC Universe Classics very well, and I think these are the best Crime Syndicate figures ever made. I had these figures in storage while I was trying to sell my old house, up until we moved into our new house. And sometime in between there, the metallic red paint on Johnny Quick's chest became really faded looking. So I don't know exactly what happened there. Maybe it was because I used cheapy Ziploc bags to store them in. I'm either going to have to find some metallic red paint that matches the rest of his costume and repaint him himself, or buy an all-new Johnny Quick figure online to replace this one with. Right behind them is the DC Universe Classics Professor Zoom, the Reverse Flash. Then we have the DC UC Superpower Style Steppenwolf figure. Next to him is the DC UC Superpower Style Desaad figure. Right behind them is the Mattel DC Superheroes Dark Side figure, with the head from the DC Universe Classics Collect and Connect Dark Side. I always thought the original head this figure came with was a little bit too small. And the head sculpt from the Build-A-Figure fits on the neck peg of the DC Superheroes Dark Side perfectly. And I think the colors match really well too. Behind Power Ring is a DC Direct Bizarro figure, a DC Superheroes Brainiac figure, that I found for $8 at this weird store called Cargo Largo. Where I think they buy partially damaged pallets of freight, or maybe they just hijack trucks. I don't know where they get their stuff from, but they always have weird random things like this, and a lot of times you can find a pretty good deal. Right behind them is the DC Universe Classics Copperhead figure. And in the very back is the DC Universe Wave 1 Etrigan the Demon that I picked up recently in a trade. I used to have the old DC Direct Demon, and I was planning on replacing him with the DC Icons version, but that one got cancelled. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, we have the DC Universe Classics Lex Luthor from the Gotham City 5 pack in the costume that he wore in the old Hanna-Barbera Super Friends cartoons. Then behind him we have the DCUC Classic Cheetah figure, and the DC Universe Classics Black Adam figure. And behind him, in the big purple collar, is the Ocean Master figure from the Maddie Collector Club Infinite Earth subscription series thing. Then up top is another DC Multiverse Justice League Parademon figure. And I bought these figures at Toys R Us, Buy one, get one 40% off. These are kind of mediocre. They have lots of points of articulation, but the range of movement is pretty poor. And their paint is just so-so. However, they look just fine in the back of a display like this, and I think they are generic enough to fit in with just about any New Gods collection. Moving back to the front is the DC Universe Classics Captain Cold figure, and the DC Universe Classics Deathstroke the Terminator, 
which is another one of my all-time favorite DCUC figures, because of all the unique sculpted and painted detail, and the amount of accessories he comes with. I used his original rifle for a custom, so I gave him a Marvel Legends sniper rifle instead. Behind him is a Black Manta figure that came in a two-pack with Aquaman, and I really like this figure a lot too. Then we have the old DC Direct Dr. Savannah, and a DC Direct Brainiac 13 that looks cool as hell. He has all these bendy wire tentacles that plug into his traps, and the armor on his chest looks like the skull head from the Superpowers version of Brainiac. And finally, in the very back corner is an old DC Direct Despero figure. I'm not sure exactly what series he originally came in, because I bought mine loose at a local comic book shop. But he's a lot bigger and more imposing looking than the DC Universe Classics Collect and Connect Despero. Now, I'm not the best at posing action figures, I'm not going to be winning any ACBA contests anytime soon, but I've always noticed that when I see photos of someone else's collection of DC Universe figures online, they're typically standing in neutral poses like this. And you can get a lot more figures on your shelf this way, but I think the main reason is because these figures just aren't as posable as a lot of other action figures, like Marvel Legends, for instance. I really wish that the people at Mattel would look at some other action figure lines and use them as an example to improve the articulation on the DC Multiverse figures. I think that they are slowly making progress in the DC Multiverse line, but their figures are coming out so slowly that my interest is fading fast. On top of my second Billy bookcase is another little group of die-cast bat vehicles. First of all, on top of this first plexiglass case is a matchbox bat plane from Batman v Superman. Then we have a bat ice sled thing from Batman and Robin, and an Ertl die-cast bat jet from Batman the Animated Series. Inside this case is a Jada 124th scale 1989 Batmobile with a die-cast metal Batman figurine, flanked by a couple of Hot Wheels 164th scale 1989 Batmobiles. On top of the second case to the right are two 164th scale Hot Wheels bat flying vehicles from The Dark Knight Rises. And this one larger one in the center was made by Matchbox for their Skybusters line. Inside that case is a Jada die-cast metal 124th scale Tumblr Batmobile from the Dark Knight Trilogy. This vehicle also comes with a mini Batman figurine. I really love these die-cast 124th scale models by Jada. They're only about $20 each, they're really good quality, and each one has an opening cockpit, an in-scale die-cast Batman figurine, and the 1989 Batmobile even has the machine guns that flip up. I think they're excellent value for your money. And then in front are some Eagle Moss 143rd scale Batmobiles from the Automobilia line. From left to right we have the All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder Batmobile. There's a Batmobile from a comic book called Batman the Return. There's a Batman Black and White Batmobile. Then in the center we have a really silly flying Batcave model from the comics in the 1950s or 60s. There's a Hot Wheels 150 scale Batmobile. I think it came in a Toys R Us exclusive 3 pack. And I'm not sure what comic book this is from specifically. Then we have an Eagle Moss 143rd scale Batman and Robin Batmobile from the Grant Morrison run where Dick Grayson filled in as Batman. And then we have a mid 2000s era comic book style Batmobile. This Billy bookcase in the center is where I keep my 3 and 3 quarter inch Star Wars Death Star display. These display bases are called Ultramas and they are a modular display system. The half circle piece is actually one half of an Ultrama. These parts connect back to back and you can stack them on top of each other too if you want. In fact if you had a bunch of these Ultramas then you could connect the bases together and stack them as high as you wanted. You could build these up like a pillar in the middle of a room and have a 360 degree Death Star diorama playset. Now before you go searching for these online Sadly, the company that made these went out of business, and they're no longer available. You might be able to find one on the secondary market, but the last time I saw them on eBay, they were going for a lot of money. I saw these advertised on the Rebel Scum forums years ago, and I bought two sets. I think they were originally $30 each. They're so big that I only have one and a half of mine on display at the moment. These came with cardstock backgrounds, but you could make up your own, or you could leave them out if you wanted. They had lots to choose from, but I picked these space station backgrounds because they were obviously intended to be used for Death Star dioramas. The best thing about them is that the bases are riddled with small peg holes, and each set included a baggie of pegs like this. That's the primo shit right there, man. You insert one end of the peg into the figure's foot, and then plug the other end of the peg into one of the holes in the base. This keeps the figures from falling over and knocking down other figures, too. I have my Star Wars figures displayed in these little vignettes. I tried to recreate moments or scenes from the first movie, but some of them are just made up. 
Like here in the corner, I have an Imperial officer and some scanning crewmen. Like he's their boss, like bitching at them about whatever's on his clipboard. There are the heroes in the Red Room making a plan to rescue Princess Leia and shut down the tractor beam. For dioramas based on New Hope, I only use Chewbacca figures like this with their hair slicked back. Because he didn't have the bangs like he does in Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. This old Power of the Force 2 Han Solo and Stormtrooper disguise was part of a mail-away promotion with Kellogg's or whoever makes Fruit Loops. You had to send in proofs of purchase from boxes of cereal, but they weren't just regular sized boxes. They were the giant family sized boxes. And I had to eat Fruit Loops for months because of this figure. And I got so sick and tired of fucking Fruit Loops that I haven't eaten them again for nearly 20 years. Then we have the Legacy Collection Obi-Wan Kenobi figure, which is probably my favorite Star Wars figure of all time. And in the back is a true vintage C-3PO. I bought him for a couple of dollars because he was in really bad shape, and I repainted him with gold acrylic paints. On either side of him are chairs that came with the Playmates 3 and 3 quarter inch Star Trek figures. Here we have Chewbacca in handcuffs being escorted to the detention level by Han and Luke in Stormtrooper disguise. And there's a little mouse droid that Chewbacca growls at and frightens away. When I was a kid, I used to call this the shoeshine droid. And back here we have C-3PO with a small communication device trying to explain to a stormtrooper that R2-D2 needs maintenance. And I really like posing these stormtrooper figures scratching their heads with their trigger finger like they're confused. I don't know why I get such a kick out of that. Maybe because it's so absurd. Then in front is Obi-Wan Kenobi using the Force to distract these two stormtroopers so he can deactivate the tractor beam. Next we have a stormtrooper and a couple of Death Star troopers entering the detention level where Han Solo is blasting a computer terminal. This computer terminal is a diorama piece that came with some of the three and three quarter inch Star Trek figures by Playmates. And this is one of those little blast effect pieces that came with Star Wars figures around the time of Attack of the Clones. On the next shelf down we have Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker with a grappling hook about to swing over a chasm. And I can't remember what these are called exactly. These figures came in a two-pack during the Power of the Force 2 era. They have a few points of articulation, but they're basically just plastic statues. And in front of them is a Power of the Jedi era Death Star Escape Han Solo figure. I don't know what it is about this figure, but I really like him a lot. And I think he has a really good likeness to Harrison Ford. A lot of collectors complain about these older Star Wars figures from the 90s, but compared to the boring 5 POA figures with super shitty paint apps that we get nowadays, these older figures don't seem so bad. Then we have our heroes all fleeing to the Millennium Falcon, with an army of stormtroopers chasing behind them. I have some more articulated, better looking stormtroopers in front, and I use some old Power of the Force 2 stormtroopers in back as filler. Those older figures are cheap as hell now, and for dioramas and displays like this, you need a shitload of stormtroopers. There is no such thing as too many stormtroopers. Here's Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi in their final duel, and this is another two-pack of pre-posed figures from the Power of the Force 2 days. I really like these figures a lot because even if you had super articulated Darth Vader and Obi-Wan figures, it would be hard to get them in such dynamic poses like these. And the same goes for this third Power of the Force 2 2-pack with Chewbacca and Han Solo. I think these look really badass, like they're taking out a few more stormtroopers just before they board the Millennium Falcon. Behind them is a stormtrooper with a cheap helmet that's turned green on him, and now he's hiding his face in shame. And finally is probably my favorite Darth Vader figure. He's super articulated. He has a removable helmet, and he comes with a figure stand that's meant to look like the robe of a vanquished Obi-Wan Kenobi. In fact, there's even an Obi-Wan Kenobi lightsaber hill sculpted in the folds. And finally, on the bottom shelf, I try to recreate the scene where Tarkin and Darth Vader are questioning Princess Leia about the location of the hidden rebel base, right before they destroy Alderaan. Yes, I know this is out of order, but this display just isn't as exciting as the other two, so that's why I put this one on the bottom shelf. And I know I bitched a lot about the current... 5 POA Star Wars figures, and some of them do look like Happy Meal toys to me. But these Stormtrooper figures are well sculpted, and they work well as filler in a diorama like this. Standing straight up like this with their arms at their sides wouldn't work for an action scene, but it works just fine if you want them standing in attention. And I think the 5 POA figures are a good supplement to your collection. But it broke my heart to see them replace the super articulated figures a few years ago. Over on this side is a Death Star gunner manning a Death Star cannon. This is an old G.I. Joe cannon that I found really cheap, and I repainted it gunmetal gray, and the design of this cannon puts me in mind of the cannon on top of the vintage Death Star playset. On the opposite side is the Jabba's sail barge cannon that I repainted gunmetal gray, and behind that is the light-up cannon from Episode 1. The other figures in this diorama are just acting out normal day-to-day -day shit that goes on behind the scenes on the Death Star. There's an Imperial scanning crewman 
inspecting some E-11 blasters on a weapons rack, there's a few droids milling around, and there's a Death Star Trooper working on another one of those computer terminals that came with the three and three quarter inch Star Trek figures. Alright, so there you have it. There's my Death Star diorama slash playset. And if you happen to come across one of these Ultrama displays for a decent price, then I'd say go for it, because I'm really happy with mine. However, with a Jabba's sail barge being fully funded, an official Death Star playset from Hasbro may actually happen someday. This is one of the main reasons why I prefer 3 and 3 quarter inch Star Wars figures over the 6 inch scale. I think something as big and epic as Star Wars is better served by a smaller scale action figure line, because you can get more vehicles, dioramas, and play sets that are in scale with your figures. Here's my last little group of die-cast Batmobiles and other Bat vehicles. First off in this case to the left is the Jada 124th scale Arkham Knight Batmobile with an opening cockpit and a mini die-cast metal Arkham Knight Batman figurine. And on top of that case is a set of five basic 164th scale Hot Wheels Arkham Knight Batmobiles. In the case on the right is a Jada die-cast metal 124th scale Batman v Superman Batmobile model kit. And since I bought this model kit, Jada has reissued it, fully assembled, with a die-cast metal Ben Affleck Batman figurine to go along with their other 124th scale Batmobiles. And above it is a few basic Hot Wheels 164th scale Batmobiles from Batman v Superman and Justice League. Moving back to the left here in front is a Corgi 124th scale 2000s era comic book style Batmobile. Now, I would love to have the Corgi 143rd scale version of this Batmobile, but I've never been able to find one at a good price. And I just picked this one up at a local comic book convention for less money than the smaller 143rd scale version would have cost me on eBay. Next we have a Hot Wheels Bat Cycle with a Batman figurine sculpted on it. Then we have a die-cast metal Batman the Animated Series figure by Ertl. And here's a Hot Wheels Bat Pod from the Dark Knight Trilogy with a little plastic figure that I bought at a dollar store. I think he scales really nicely with a bat pod. And finally we have a trio of Batmobile monster trucks. These are all based on the same mold, but they have slight paint variations. And this one on the end has low profile wheels and tires. I'm really stoked about finally having my X-Men figures out on display. Just like many other people out there around my age, I first started getting into the X-Men in the 1990s. I watched the cartoon show every Saturday, I had VHS tapes from Pizza Hut, and I started reading the X-Men comics. When I think of the X-Men, I automatically think of these characters, and I automatically imagine them wearing these costumes. Even when I'm reading a modern comic with these characters, I retcon it in my head, and I imagine they're wearing their 90s costumes instead. In the back corner on one of my custom action figure flight stands is the Marvel Legends Archangel figure. I think this figure might have been in the Rocket Raccoon wave, but I'm not 100% sure, because I never saw any of these figures at retail. I had to buy this one loose on eBay. In the very front is a Toys R Us exclusive Jubilee Build-A-Figure. And I would prefer it if she were in her pink shirt and jorts, like in the cartoon show, but I don't want to customize this figure because she's so rare and expensive on the secondary market. So this modern costume is close enough to her 90s costume for the time being. And this is the part where I catch hell from all the scale Nazis out there, but I don't mind mixing Marvel Select figures with my Marvel Legends. I think this Colossus figure fits in just fine with Marvel Legends and he cost me a lot less than the old Toy Biz Marvel Legends Colossus would have. And likewise for this Marvel Select Gambit figure, the old Toy Biz Marvel Legends Gambit looks like hot garbage compared to this one. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get a new Marvel Legends version from Hasbro before too long. I still like this Storm figure a lot, even though her head is really tiny and she's kind of spindly looking. I think I only paid $10 for her mint on card. I've debated on whether or not to repaint the costume white or silver to make her look more like she did in the cartoon show. But I imagine that Hasbro will probably give us a 90s version of Storm in the next couple of years. And when that happens, I'll probably just end up throwing this figure on eBay. So I don't want to take the time to repaint her now. I really like that Funnel Cloud flight stand that she came with. And there are a few of my custom lightning bolt effects pieces that I made out of twisty ties coated in Plastidip. Up next is a Marvel Select Wolverine figure with custom metal claws. And then we have the Return of Marvel Legends era Jean Grey on a custom action figure flight stand. I think she was in the same wave as Archangel. I never saw any of them at retail stores, so I had to resort to Evil Bay. Fortunately, she wasn't very expensive at the time. I got her loose for about $20. I wouldn't mind if Hasbro revisited this version of Jean, though. And it would be cool if she came with an alternate head, with a head sock and a ponytail, like she had in the animated series. Then in the very back is the Marvel Select Magneto. 
And this is the best Magneto figure in my opinion. The old Toy Biz version was just a repainted Iron Man figure. And I had one of the Toys R Us exclusive Magneto figures for a while. But I was like, this figure sucks. And I sold him on eBay. The upcoming Marvel Legends version is a newer costume that I don't recognize. And I think the Revel Tech Magneto looks a little too beefy and stylized to fit in with my figures. And that crazy articulated cape is a no-go for me. I know a lot of people will be like, that Marvel Select version is too big for a Marvel Legends display. But if you have them elevated above your other figures like I have here, the scale issue goes away. I'll admit this figure isn't as poseable, but even if he had more articulation, I'd probably still be putting him in a pose just like this. Next we have my custom 90s or Jim Lee style Cyclops that I made several years ago. This is a Marvel Select Cyclops figure that I bought for a song. I sculpted all the bands around his forearms, thighs, and calves. I sculpted the harness and pouch belt, and I just sculpted the hair right on top of the figure's head and repainted his forehead flesh tone. And again, he's obviously not as poseable as the Marvel Legends version, but even if he was, I'd probably wind up posing him just like this anyway. This beast figure is my favorite Toy Biz Marvel Legend. And there's no doubt in my mind that Hasbro made the Spider-Man villain Jackal with the intention of reusing that body for an updated beast. I'm actually surprised he hasn't been officially announced yet. But if you want a bigger, Jim Lee style beast, then I'd try to find this one for a good price. He has excellent articulation. He has nice ankle rockers, a toe pivot, hinged jaw, and articulated fingers that work really well and actually don't look bad. Behind Cyclops and Beast is the new Marvel Legends Cable figure that I just picked up around Easter. I like the big rifle that he came with, but he can't hold it worth a shit. And the two Nerf guns he came with are a little underwhelming. So I gave him one of the bigger guns that came with a Marvel Select Cable that I replaced with this Marvel Legends version. It cracks me up to think of Cable running around shooting people with a gun that looks like a VCR. Now this is definitely the best Cable figure, but he would have been a slam dunk if he came with alternate hands so he could carry two guns at once. In the back behind Cable is the old Toy Biz Iceman figure on his ice formation base. Back to the front again we have the 90's era Juggernaut Wave Rogue figure. And then we have the Marvel Select 90's Sabretooth with a kick-ass diorama slash display base. And my neighbor is mowing his yard again for the second time in four days. And finally in back is a custom Sentinel made out of one of those shitty, cheap 12-inch Titan series Iron Man figures. The square things around his head and his nose are made out of sticky back foam sheets, and I repainted him with acrylic paints. He's not that great, but he was an easy, inexpensive custom. I know a lot of collectors get hard for the old Toy Biz Sentinel Build-A-Figure, but I don't think they look very good. And I didn't have money for the Marvel Universe Sentinel when they were available at retail. I think Jack Specific, or whoever makes those big figs, should make characters like Galactus, Giant Man, and the Sentinel here. Imagine if they made an 18 inch or even a 4 foot figure of a character that's actually supposed to be big instead of just Batman and Stormtroopers. Then they'd have a lot of 6 inch collectors like me buying their products also. Down here on the next shelf is the rest of my X-Men figures. I have some Chris Claremont and John Byrne era figures on the left. I have the original 5 X-Men in the center. Then I have some more modern versions of X-Men characters over on the right with some villains mixed in. Here in front we have the Warlock Wave Sunfire figure. The Marvel Select Kurt Wagner, a.k.a. Nightcrawler. And I painted the shadow on his face to make him look more like he does in the comics. In the back corner is the Marvel Select Classic or First Appearance Storm figure. I think just like with the 90's version, Hasbro will probably give us a Storm figure in this costume before too long. This Marvel Select version looks really nice, but our articulation is really weak, and the cape is made from such hard plastic that you can't really pose her at all. Then in the front again we have the Juggernaut Wave Wolverine. I saw about a dozen or so of the retro carded Wolverine figures, and none of them had paint that was as good as this one, so I'm pretty happy to have him. Then we have the Juggernaut Wave Jean Grey Phoenix with a relaxed hair alternate head that came with his Toys R Us exclusive Cyclops and Dark Phoenix 2-pack. I really love this set. It's probably one of my favorite things I picked up last year. This Optic Blast and the Cyclops figure originally came with a cheapy Superman figure that I bought at 5 Below, specifically for this effects piece. These two are on a custom flight stand slash diorama piece that I made. In the back is a Spider-Man Classics Juggernaut figure. In deep breath, I like this figure more because he's not as big as most other versions of Juggernaut. The Marvel Select Juggernaut looks awesome, but I'm not a big enough fan of Juggernaut to have a figure that eats up so much real estate on my shelf. 
The Marvel Legends Build-A-Figure is cool, but I didn't want him badly enough to buy that version of Cable or that super boring modern Havoc figure. Plus, I essentially got two or three of the figures in that way for free after I sold the Build-A-Figure parts on eBay. Next to him is the Mystique figure from the Epic Heroes wave, and this figure is modeled after the way she appeared in her solo series, but the hairstyle is all wrong, because she had shorter hair in those comics. Mystique is one of my favorite X-Men characters, and an updated classic version is at the top of my Marvel Legends wish list. I'd also love to have a movie version of Mystique, preferably the Rebecca Romaine version over the Jennifer Lawrence version. Then in the center is my Toys R Us exclusive, all-new X-Men set. Basically, Marvel has turned Scott Summers into more of a cult leader than a superhero. And in the wake of Schism and AVX, Beast goes back in time and brings the original five X-Men to the present day to show Cyclops the error of his ways. It's a silly premise, but I was really enjoying that book when these figures first came out. Unfortunately, Hasbro was really phoning it in on this set. There's a lot of reuse here, and the new parts that were sculpted for these figures are pretty mediocre. These are supposed to be the teenage versions of these characters, but Cyclops and Angel are reusing the Bucky Cat mold, so they're way bigger than they should be. Iceman is on a really old, outdated buck body, and looks more like he should be called Milkman. This Jean Grey figure barely stands on her own, and she has a big monster hand like David Grohl in the music video for Everlong. This Beast figure lacks wrist articulation, and the way his feet are sculpted, you can't get him into any kind of crouching pose. The worst part is the paint. There's yellow peeking through the blue on all of these figures. The more I look at them, the more I dislike them. And I've been debating on whether or not I should try to fix them up myself, or just throw them onto eBay to make room for new figures. This angel figure originally came with a really derpy looking face. So I replaced that head with this one from an MCU Captain America figure, that for whatever reason does not look like Chris Evans. It just looks like a generic white dude with blonde hair. Maybe it's Chris Evans' stunt double, because he charges less for his likeness rights. A lot of people have bought two Walgreens exclusive Mr. Fantastic figures, and have been using this head for a powered down Johnny Storm. I've only ever found one of the Mr. Fantastic figures in the wild, so I'm using this Chris Evans stuntman head sculpt for my angel figure instead. The big X-Men logo in the back is a custom display piece that I made from insulation styrofoam. And I think I'm going to make a base for it so it stands up a little higher. Here in front is the old Toy Biz Galactus Wave Professor X figure. And this is still a definitive Professor X. I really hope Hasbro makes a new Professor X figure in the yellow hover chair from the 90s. Then we have a Kitty Pride figure from the Juggernaut Wave. And I really love this figure a lot because I think she has that girl next door vibe. Here I have the old man Logan figure with a head sculpt from a NECA video game figure that I bought at Toys R Us on clearance for $4. So now he's a young man Logan. And I really prefer this over the unmasked Wolverine head sculpt that Hasbro put with a retro carded Wolverine for instance. And the skin tone matches perfectly so I didn't even have to paint anything. Next we have a modern Mohawk Storm from the Toys R Us exclusive Jubilee Wave. I ordered her from the Toys R Us website along with the rest of the wave, buy one get one 50% off. They shipped two of the figures, and then a few days later, I got two more of them, and then Toys R Us canceled my order for this Storm figure. I'm not glad they're going out of business or anything, but the Toys R Us website was a fucking joke. Anyways, then I hopped on eBay and bought this Storm figure mint in box for $40, which worked out since I got two of the figures in the way for 50% off. And I'm glad I bought her when I did, because I've seen her going for triple digits since then. Here in front is a custom magic figure that I put together last year. I made her out of a Nico figure from the Dormammu wave with a few parts from the Red Onslaught wave Mockingbird. There's a full review of this custom magic figure on my channel if you're interested. Behind her is Hope Summers, and I kind of dug her in Uncanny X-Men, but I lost track of her after AVX. This figure is kind of frustrating, and I was never able to get her to hold the rifle she came with, so I gave her the rifle that came with a Deadpool figure instead. And in the very back is the old Toy Biz Pyro figure. Moving back up to the front is the Juggernaut Wave Deadpool figure. I really prefer this over the new first appearance version from the Sasquatch Wave. He comes with a ton of cool accessories and has so many new parts added to him that you can barely tell he's reusing the old Bucky Cat Buck body. I think he looks enough like the movie version that you could fudge him in with your other movie figures if you wanted to. Next is the most recent Iceman figure, also from the Juggernaut Wave. And I think the only way he could be better is if he had come with some ice blast effects and interchangeable parts, so you could use them as a classic Iceman if you wanted. Even if it was just an alternate head without the ice hair sculpted on it, I probably would have bought another one to replace my old Toy Biz version. 
The Pizza Spidey Buck Bonnie that this Iceman figure is based on is one of my favorite bucks that Hasbro uses. I wish the Walgreens exclusive Human Torch used this instead of the Bucky Cat mold. Behind him is an old Toy Biz Mr. Sinister that I bought for $5 loose. He had a lot of scuffs and scratches, so I repainted him to make him more presentable. And finally in the back is an articulated icon's Temple Guardian Samurai that I customized into a Silver Samurai figure. There's a review of this custom on my channel if you'd like to find out more about him. I put him on a custom flight stand to help make it less obvious that he's a little out of scale. Okay, so I just decided I'm going to pull these all-new X-Men figures out of this display to make room for the new figures from the Apocalypse Wave and a couple figures from the second Deadpool wave coming out later this year. I have everything I need to make a custom Emma Frost figure, I just need to take time to sit down and do it. I'd also love to have a Weapon X Wolverine figure, but aside from that, if I get all the new figures I want later this year, then I will have completed the list of X-Men figures I made when I first started collecting Marvel Legends. And after that, I'll just be replacing some of these older, outdated figures with newer, better looking versions as they get released. Here's my Avengers action figure collection, and this is a little bit different. I have mostly classic versions of the Avengers over on the left, and on the right are more modern versions. And these aren't meant to be any specific teams from runs in the comics or anything like that. This is just characters that I like most with some Avengers villains mixed in. Here in front is a custom, classic Hank Pym Ant-Man figure that I made out of a Walgreens exclusive Eric O'Grady Black Ant. I sculpted the boot cuffs on him, but aside from that, it's just a repaint. I didn't take the figure apart and sand down the joints and paint them, because every time I've done that, they get really loose and floppy. And I think he looks kind of cool this way, with the black breaking up the mostly red costume. I'm not a great customizer, but I think my strong suit is painting, and I'm pretty proud of the way this figure turned out. Right below him is the Antony accessory that came with the movie Ant-Man figure, with a tiny Marvel Select Ant-Man figure riding it. Right next to my custom Ant-Man is one of the first custom 6-inch figures that I ever made. This is a Black Widow figure in the gray costume, loosely based on a famous image by an illustrator named Joe Chiodo. The base body is a DC Universe Classics Donna Troy figure that a friend of mine gave me for free, and the head is from a DC Direct Tomorrow Woman figure that I bought for $5 at a local comic book shop. I took some liberties with the costume design. I think the belt breaks up the monotony of the all-gray costume. I picked up an extra Black Widow figure on the Retro Toy Biz style card back for $5 on clearance. I might use that to make a better custom of this version of Black Widow. Because I don't want to spend buku bucks for the old Hasbro version that came in a two-pack with Winter Soldier. Next up we have the Marvel Select Ultron figure and a Marvel Legends style Ultron that came in a Walmart exclusive wave that was released in support of Iron Man 3. So I kind of consider the taller Marvel Select Ultron as Ultron Prime. And I think of the smaller Hasbro figure as an Ultron drone. On the other side behind Black Widow is the Marvel Legends Red Skull from the Mandroid Wave. And right behind them, also from the Mandroid Wave, are a pair of Marvel Legends AIM soldiers. And I really love these figures, mostly because of the ridiculous beekeeper helmets. They really stand out on the shelf. Then in the very back is the classic comic book style Marvel Select Thanos. And next to him is a comic book style Vision figure that came from the Hulkbuster Wave. And to be honest, I would much prefer a classic Vision figure, but the old Toy Biz version might look a little too small compared to some of these other figures. And I basically got this Vision for free after I sold the Hulkbuster Build-A-Figure parts on eBay. Next up is a classic Iron Man figure from a Toys R Us exclusive 2-pack. This is one of my very first Marvel Legends figures, and I bought it loose from another collector that I met on a Star Wars fan site. Then we have a Whirlwind figure from the Red Onslaught Wave. And I don't really care too much about this character, but I bought him for 5 bucks on clearance, and after selling the Build-A-Figure part, I got this guy for like $2. And there's nothing really wrong with him, he's an okay figure, but he will be the first one to go if I need to make room for another figure on this shelf. Next we have the old Toy Biz Marvel Legends Captain America figure that I bought loose at Vintage Stock for 6 or $7. His paint was kind of sloppy, so I touched him up here and there. And I painted the black shadow on the front of his mask. The shield is from a more modern Captain America figure. And even though this cap's proportions are a little wonky, I still really like him a lot. Behind them is the Marvel Select Classic Hawkeye figure. And I've got him hunched over because he's not in scale with most of these figures. However, I think he looks good. And I prefer this figure over the Odin Wave Hawkeye with a Winter Soldier arm. 
Next up is a Marvel Select Spider-Woman figure on a custom flight stand. I got this figure really cheap several years ago, and I didn't feel the need to replace her with the Marvel Legends version from the Thanos wave. Right behind Cap is the Target exclusive 3-pack Captain Marvel, or Miss Marvel figure. And this is my favorite costume for Carol Danvers, probably because it shows the most skin. I had to touch up the paint in a few spots in this figure, and the flesh tone paint on her thighs was really sloppy. So I just removed it altogether. Her boot cuffs come up a little bit higher than they should, but I think it looks a million times better than it did before. Moving to the back of above my Hawkeye, on a custom flight stand, is the old Toy Biz classic Thor figure. And I just got this figure recently in a trade. I've been wanting this figure for a really long time, and I'm thrilled to finally have him. He's tied for first place as my favorite Thor figure. In the center of this display, all the way in the back, is the Marvel Select classic Incredible Hulk figure. And I like the way this figure scales with Marvel Legends. He was easy to get a hold of, and for such a large figure, he was relatively inexpensive at $25. I really prefer this version over the really gross, overly vascular Mark Silvestri style Marvel Select Hulk. I would love to have the old Hulk figure from the Toy Biz Face Off 2 pack, but I can't bring myself to spend as much money as he goes for on the secondary market. Moving back to the front is a more modern Captain America figure from the Mandroid Wave. I think this costume is from all new, all different Avengers or something like that. I remember I read the first few issues and I couldn't really get into it, but I do like this costume design for Cap. Right behind him is the Baron Zemo figure, also from the Mandroid Wave. And I was just about to buy an old Toy Biz Baron Zemo on eBay when this figure was announced. Next we have a modern Hawkeye, and this was another one of those figures that I never saw at retail and was forced to buy loose on eBay. I had to touch up a lot of the paint on his arms, and I painted the frames of his sunglasses black. And I think the face kind of resembles Jeremy Renner. I bought a Legolas figure from one of the Hobbit movies on clearance just for the arrows that came with him. Because for some reason, Hasbro can't be bothered to include arrows with any of these Hawkeye figures. Up above them on a custom action figure flight stand is a Marvel Legends Scarlet Witch figure. I traded one of her magic effects with the MCU style Scarlet Witch figure that I bought for my wife. And right behind her is the Return of Marvel Legends Thor figure. And like I said, he's tied for first place along with the old Toy Biz version for my favorite Thor figure. I think this is a nice update to Thor's costume that doesn't piss all over the original. And I love how this figure looks exactly like the artwork by Olivier Coipel. Next up in front is the Bleeding Edge or Heroic Age Iron Man figure from the Walmart exclusive line that came out to coincide with the release of Iron Man 3. And this was probably my favorite 6 inch Iron Man figure up until I got the one from the Black Panther wave. This figure doesn't come with any alternate hands or blast effects like a lot of Iron Man figures do, but he's really fun to play around with and pose. Right behind him is the brand new Taskmaster figure from the MCU Thanos Build-A-Figure wave. I saw one of these figures a few weeks earlier than their official street date, but that one was $25, and he had bad paint. Fortunately, I was able to find this figure at Toys R Us on March 3rd. I actually pulled this one right out of a case. I think this figure looks a million times better than that weird Udon version that came out a year or so ago. I repainted the eyes on mine all black, and I put a tiny white dot in the center of each eye. I'm really happy with the way it turned out, and I think he looks better now. Moving back to the front is a recent Black Widow figure that came with a motorcycle. Now, I really love Black Widow. I'm happy to have a new figure of her based on the recent Mark Wade and Chris Samney 12 issue series, but this figure is a little underwhelming. The Black Widow figure from the Retro Toy Biz Wave is way more fun than this figure, and she fits on the bike better than this figure does too. Next to her is the most recent Hank Pym Giant Man from the MCU Ultron Build-A-Figure Wave. This was the costume he was wearing in Rage of Ultron, where he and Ultron merged together to become Pymtron, which was pretty fucking crazy. I bought this figure for $5 on clearance. I actually really like the head sculpt, and the antenna don't bother me as much as I thought they would. But the paint on this figure is pretty atrocious. And fortunately, I just picked up this Scott Lang Astonishing Ant-Man figure at my local Toys R Us with a 15% discount. This figure looks just like he walked out of a panel from Nick Spencer's Astonishing Ant-Man series. If you're like me and you haven't read much Ant-Man stuff, but you really enjoyed the Ant-Man movie, then you should check out Astonishing Ant-Man. I think it's very accessible to new readers, and it's really clever and funny. And I'm very happy to have a figure based on it. Next we have another Ultron drone, and behind him are a couple of Hydra soldiers. One is the standard Hydra soldier from the Mandroid Build-A-Figure wave, and the one with a vest on is from the Toys R Us exclusive Hydra 2 pack that I just picked up recently. And it occurs to me that 
Toys R Us stores should have carried some of their exclusive figures before they started going out of business. It seems like it might have been a good idea. Next to them is the Nebula figure from the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 Mantis Build-A-Figure Wave. And I typically don't mix movie figures with my comic book style figures. However, there's a recent Thanos comic series where Thanos' son, Thane, recruits Champion, Star Fox, and Nebula here to help him kill Thanos. And in that series, Nebula is drawn exactly like she looks in the movies. In the back, on a custom action figure flight stand, is the MCU Ultron Build-A-Figure Wave Wasp in her modern black and gold costume. I bought a second Wasp figure on clearance for $5 to customize into a classic red and black version with a pointy headgear, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. And finally in the corner is the new Walmart-exclusive comic book-style modern Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet. This is a great figure for $20, but I would have been super fucking pissed if I'd bought Hellcat or some other figures I didn't want in order to complete the Build-A-Figure, only to have Hasbro reissue it in a better color scheme with more accessories just a few years later. I'm tempted to pick up the Disney Store exclusive Marvel Select comic book style Thanos figure because I think he looks realistic enough to fit in with my MCU figures. At the time of this recording, we're still a few days away from Infinity War, and I'm really looking forward to the movie, but I absolutely hate the sleeveless, helmetless character design for Thanos. I wish his Infinity War costume was the same one he wore in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And the new comic book style Marvel Select version looks close enough for me. Moving up above the window on this side are a few autographed 8x10s. First is Summer Glau, who is in the Sarah Connor Chronicles. She played Ravenger for a bit on Arrow. And she was River Tam and Firefly and Serenity. I took my kid with me to Planet Comic Con the day I got this signature, and Summer Glau was super sweet to my daughter. She signed this photo and wrote, No power in the verse can stop me. I think if you were looking for some inspirational words to live by, you could do a lot worse than that. In the center is a signed photo of Richard LaPermentier, who is Admiral Mahdi in the original Star Wars. He's the guy who Darth Vader force chokes in the Death Star briefing scene, and the only other thing I've ever seen him in was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He was Eddie's police detective friend. And if you haven't seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or if you haven't seen it for a long time, I caught it on Netflix a while back, and it's still amazing. Richard LaPermentier signed this, The Force Works, and then signed his name. And sadly, Richard LaPermentier passed away the week after I got this signed at Planet Comic Con, which is a real shame because he seemed like a legit nice guy, and it was a pleasure to get to meet him. Next up is my autographed 8x10 by Sean Mayer. I know him mostly as Simon Tam from Firefly and Serenity, but he's done a lot of voice acting for animated DC movies. He was in a remake of Brian's Song, and he was briefly in Arrow. He signed this to my wife and I and wrote, This must be what going mad feels like. Then he wrote, Congratulations on the nuptials, because we told him we were about to get married. He seemed like a hell of a nice guy, and I was really upset when his character was killed off so quickly in Arrow. I'm going to have to rearrange these a little to make room for the new Alan Tudyk and Kevin Conroy autographs I got at Planet Comic Con 2018. Down on this built-in shelf in front of the window is my collection of DC Comics Vinyl Vixens by Funko. Now, I'm not a huge Funko fan, and in fact, I actively dislike Funko Pops. I don't know what it is about these vinyl vixens. I typically don't go for stuff like this, but I really like these a lot for some reason. My mom gave me the Catwoman and Batgirl as gifts, and my wife bought the Wonder Woman for me at a local toy store. I think the only one I don't have is the Suicide Squad movie Harley Quinn. I guess Funko has stopped making these in favor of the smaller, less expensive rock candy vinyl dolls. Then down below are some Star Wars, The Last Jedi, three and three quarter inch action figures. This shelf isn't going to be their permanent home, but I don't have a better place to display them yet, and I don't feel like putting them up in storage, because I keep adding to this collection with figures that I find on clearance. First we have five Praetorian Guards. Two of them are from the Super Articulated Black Series line, and those are the only two that I've ever seen in person. Next to them is Rey, and then we have a couple of Old Man Luke figures. And I want you to see if you can spot the subtle change that I made to these figures. Originally, these figures were kind of boring and a little depressing, but I've added a little something to them, and now I think they're kind of badass. Then we have a 5POA Chewbacca with a Porg, there's Mary Poppins, y'all, there's General Sucks, and an Executioner Stormtrooper. Then we have everyone's favorite new character, Rose Tico, and her sister Paige Tico. And I think that you could use this Paige figure as a Rebel Alliance fighter pilot in a Rebel hangar or a Rebel briefing diorama, and she would fit right in. If I find a few more of these figures on clearance for 2 or $3 each, I might snatch them up for filler in a diorama. 
Oh, hello there! Goodness gracious me! Then we have a modern reproduction of a three and three quarter inch Star Wars action figure C-3PO carrying case. There's a version of this that came out in the 90s with an electronic talking feature, but this is more like the vintage case, because it doesn't have that. This one came out in the early to mid 2000s in the original trilogy collection, and included Han Solo and Chewbacca action figures. Finally, we have a couple of 17 by 11 art prints. This one on the left is from a Hack Slash variant comic book cover. This is by an illustrator named Mark Dos Santos, and this is his homage to his favorite Stephen King movies. Cassie and Vlad are parked in front of the Pet Cemetery. Cassie is climbing out of Christine. And there's a reflection of Tim Curry Pennywise in the window. He said Pennywise was omitted from the cover because Image Comics didn't have the rights to use the character. He made 25 copies of this, and mine is number 13. Ooh, spooky. Next to that is a print of the cover from issue 19 of The Walking Dead by co-creator Tony Moore. And Tony Moore must live locally because he's always at cons here in Kansas City. He co-created the series with Robert Kirkman, illustrated the first six issues of the series, and continued to do cover art for a long time after that. I was a little late to the party, and I didn't have any of the first six issues for him to sign. I just read Walking Dead in trade. But Michonne is one of my favorite characters from the series, and I really love this image. So this video is long as hell. And if there's anybody still out there, I would like to thank you for watching this from the bottom of my heart. And as a reward, since I just mentioned Stephen King movies and Pennywise, I thought it would be appropriate to share the digital download code from my copy of IT. This was one of my favorite movies from last year. It made a boatload of money, so I'm sure you've probably already seen it by now, but in case you haven't, or you would like to have a copy of it on one of your devices, here's the download code for you now. So in order to stream or download a digital copy of IT, go to wb.com slash redeemmovie, enter the promo code in that white space there, and enjoy a free digital copy of IT on your friend OG Trilogy. It's not really very scary, but I'd say if you like Stranger Things, then you'll probably like this movie a lot too. And this code is good for one use only, so if you're the one who redeems it, please leave a comment down below so other people don't waste their time. Now I think that's all for me today. I really appreciate you watching this video, and I hope you come back for part four of my collection room tour. I'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye.